Chapter 22 Diet and Religion Leviticus 11, 29-47 These also shall be unclean unto you among the creeping things that creep upon the earth, the weasel and the mouse and the tortoise after his kind, and the ferret and the chameleon and the lizard and the snail and the mole. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Whosoever doth touch them, when they be dead, shall be unclean until the even. And upon whatsoever any of them, when they are dead, doth fall, it shall be unclean, whether it be any vessel of wood, or raiment, or skin, or sack, whatsoever vessel it be, wherein any work is done, it must be put into water, and it shall be unclean until the even, so it shall be cleansed. And every earthen vessel, whereinto any of them falleth, Whatsoever is in it shall be unclean, and ye shall break it. Of all meats which may be eaten, that on which such water cometh shall be unclean, and all drink that may be drunk in every such vessel shall be unclean, and everything whereupon any part of their carcass falleth shall be unclean, whether it be oven or ranges for pots, they shall be broken down, for they are unclean, and shall be unclean unto you. Nevertheless, a fountain or pit wherein there is plenty of water shall be clean, but that which toucheth their carcass shall be unclean. And if any part of their carcass fall upon any sowing seed which is to be sown, it shall be clean. But if any water be put upon the seed, and any part of their carcass fall thereon, it shall be unclean unto you. And if any beast of which ye may eat die, he that toucheth the carcass thereof shall be unclean until the even. And he that eateth of the carcass of it shall wash his clothes, and be unclean until the even. He also that beareth the carcass of it shall wash his clothes, and be unclean until the even. And every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth shall be an abomination. It shall not be eaten. Whatsoever goeth upon the belly, and whatsoever goeth upon all four, or whatsoever hath more feet among all creeping things that creep upon the earth, them ye shall not eat, for they are an abomination. Ye shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creepeth, neither shall ye make yourselves unclean with them, that ye should be defiled thereby. For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy." neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord your God, that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law of the beasts, and of the fowl, and of every living creature that moveth in the waters, and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth. To make a difference between the unclean and the clean, and between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. Leviticus 11, 29-47 Most of the comments on Leviticus 11 are embarrassing to read. We are told that the lack of refrigeration is responsible for the dietary laws. This is absurd since most of the laws cannot be related to the lack of refrigeration. One seminary professor has read these laws as having a symbolic meaning. Thus, In Leviticus 11, meditation, which is pictured by chewing the cud, is a primary mark of cleanness. If God wanted us to meditate, he would have told us so without this elaborate dietary symbolism. Yet, we are assured, the strongest aspect of the dietary regulations is symbolic. Nortze was wiser in noting. Implicit in these verses is the notion that uncleanness was something contagious. Leviticus gives us basic laws concerning sanitation and contagion, which have, to varying degrees, governed Christendom until recently, and greatly furthered social protections. Some of the requirements set forth in these verses are, first, that dead animals, insects, etc., pollute, Whatever they touch must be washed, and the person involved must bathe. Second, porous pottery vessels must be broken. What can be washed must be, but porous items can absorb infectious bacteria. 
Third, death is a form of pollution and comes from some kind of ailment. It is not a natural fact of creation, but rather of the fall, and hence represents something wrong. As a general rule, then, death is to be viewed as involving disease, and hence cleansing is the rule. Fourth, all creeping things, mice, rats and the like, are forbidden as food. Fifth, physical contacts can convey contagion. Sixth, health is a goal of holiness, because the resurrection of the body is our future. This does not mean that sickness is sin, but that sickness is an aspect of the fallen world we live in, and we must seek holiness, and God requires this as his right over us. Since the rise of Romanticism, one area of life after another has been reduced to feeling. Romanticism is hostile to law and regards the orderly life of law as repressive and at best inferior. The nature of man is held to reveal itself in its passions, not in the submissive life of law, virtue and reason. The effect of Romanticism has been great on churches and on synagogues, so that a religion of feeling has replaced ancient orthodoxies. About thirty years ago, one Jewish writer on the dietary laws observed, There is a well-known story about a rabbi who, upon coming to a new congregation, was taken aside by the president and, in a friendly manner, advised not to talk about certain topics from the pulpit, Hebrew schools, because the children had to take music and dancing lessons and needed the afternoons for play, the Sabbath, because in America one was compelled to work on the Sabbath to make a living, and making a living came first, the dietary laws, kashrut, because it was only an ancient health measure out of place in modern times, and furthermore, too much trouble for the woman to bother with two sets of dishes. The rabbi, surprised at the counsel he was receiving, asked anxiously, If I cannot talk about the Hebrew schools, and I cannot talk about the Sabbath, and I cannot talk about kashrut, what can I talk about? The president replied in mild astonishment, Why, that's no problem at all, Rabbi. Just talk about Judaism. This story, bitter though it may sound, reflects a good deal of what has passed for Jewish life in the past decades in America. The same story can be duplicated in the churches. No preaching about the law, no preaching on Romans, no preaching on controversial subjects, and so on and on. Faith has been separated from life and action, and reduced to feeling. Many who identify themselves as Jews or Christians are truly ignorant of the essentials of their faith. In marriages, men and women guilty of all kinds of offences still feel that all kinds of actions can be wiped out by the simple statement, but I love him or her. Feeling replaces faithfulness. As against this emphasis on feeling, which is not a new one in history, there have been reactions again and again in both Judaism and Christianity to a substitution of tradition for law. Very early, for example, some groups in Judaism became rigid and extreme in their interpretations of the law, seeking, in effect, to be holier than God. This has also taken place within the Church. The precision of God's law has as its purpose the simple obedience required. For example, when the law was given to Moses on the mount, certain requirements were made of the people who were to receive the covenant law. First, they were to consecrate themselves to God, to prepare to receive and obey God's covenant law. Second, they were to don freshly washed clothes to mark this new relationship. Third, to avoid associating their covenant with fertility cults, they were to avoid sexual relations for the time. Exodus 19, 14-16 This separation of their reception of God's law from anything which could resemble fertility cult practices is a simple fact. It has, however, been used to vindicate asceticism, which means importing an alien matter into a simple fact. God's requirement is... Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Verse 45. 
holiness is freedom from sin and conformity to God and his law with all our heart, mind and being, in word, thought and deed. It is a consequence of grace and the working of the Holy Spirit in us. Romans 6.22, John 3.5 We are commanded to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12.14 Diet is an aspect of holiness. Every major religion has dietary laws. Judaism, Mohammedanism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism and so on are marked by strict rules concerning acceptable foods. Among other cultures, food taboos are commonplace. Ceremonies of eating are worldwide and a sacredness is often attached to shared foods because it means a sharing of life. In some instances, the marriage ceremony has involved sharing a meal together. Eating a meal together has been a common ratification of an alliance. Food is often figuratively used for life, salvation and for Christ, as the Welsh hymn shows. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. William Williams, 1745 In the Old Testament, the showbread, and in the church, the sacramental bread, attest to the relationship of food to religion. We do not need to agree with the doctrines of transubstantiation and consubstantiation to recognize that food is typical of a variety of things in religion, and that material food and spiritual food are closely linked. The current widespread separation of diet from religion is an unusual fact of history. Because religion is total in its relevance, diet is a normal aspect of religious regulations. Particularly when the biblical rules have been so demonstrably important in maintaining life and health, their neglect is amazing. G. Campbell Morgan said of these laws, It may at least be affirmed that these requirements were based on the soundest laws of health. God, who perfectly understands the physical structure of man, knows what is good and what is harmful. There can be very little doubt that a careful examination of these provisions will demonstrate the salutary wisdom of them all. Not too long ago, A woman took legal steps against a church which suspended or excommunicated her for adultery. Her attitude was expressed very bluntly. What has God to do with my sex life? If God's purpose in Christ is to provide us with fire and life insurance and no more, then God has nothing to do with our sex life or our diet. In which case, we have only an imaginary God not the sovereign and triune Lord and Creator.